So next slide, please. Whenever the laptop catches up. So who is Volition? Next slide, please. Well, uh, first, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, uh, you know, uh, kudos to you taking time out of your uh, weekday evenings away from friends, family, kids, all that kind of stuff uh, to, to spend some time learning about real estate. Um, you know, our company really is here to try to help uh, navigate the world of real estate investing uh, and, to be this, uh, and to be a team that has your back through the process. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's our, our, our greater goal at Volition and that's what we try to do. Um, so anything you need to be successful, whether it's that is, you know, understanding questions about, um, you know, corporate structures and tax planning. Uh, we may not have the answers all the time, but we at least try to get you in uh, contact with the right people. We have a very deep network uh, of folks who have answers to these questions. Um, Lastly, we, we figure it out for you. A lot of people uh, you know, say Toronto investing doesn't work. Um, and that's, that's simply just not true. Uh, it definitely takes uh, a more sophisticated approach. Um, it has to be more research-based, it has to be more database, uh, and the uh, types of solutions that uh, are implemented tend to be a little more complicated, but you can absolutely invest in, in the Toronto market. Um, and we have great demonstrated success with our clients. Um, you know, millions of dollars have been invested with them, uh, and we've generated quite a bit of wealth with them as well. Next slide. Cool. Um, you know, this, these are our credentials. Uh, we never really like to spend too much time on this. We put it on here not to impress you guys. I, I like this this phrase, but not to impress you guys, but to impress upon you guys that uh, you know we've been there, we've done this. Uh, everybody on the Volition team is a real estate investor. Everybody has, uh, you know, deep under understanding of real estate and real estate investing. Um, yeah, they also have deep understanding of you know, personal residences, condos. Like uh, when Ed Ed was jokingly saying that he knows all of Toronto, but like really, <laughs> we do know it pretty well. Uh, and not just Toronto; we know areas outside of Toronto because we have to understand um, contrasts to to the city market. Um, and when we do personal residence work, it's often outside of the city. Uh, you know, it, pe people aren't going to find a 6,000 square foot uh, home to live inside the city. Well, not unless you're, you know, quite rich. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have deep knowledge. Next slide, please. So uh, I often get asked, like, what is it we do? And uh, like, how do we make money? So Let's, let's be, I want to be super transparent on this stuff because uh, we're business at the end of the day. So you should know how, how we make money. Um, the first thing is advisory. So that's basically, we teach, we run these classes, we teach people how to invest in real estate. Um, and this is not a moneymaker for us. Uh, we basically want to educate people. Uh, our, my best clients, I'm sure Ed and Sam, Matt can say the same, but my best clients are those that are well-educated. Because those that really understand investing well know when there's a good deal in front of them. They can identify opportunity. Um, there's actually nothing more frustrating for me than when I'm out with clients looking at properties, we find a good deal, but they're not at that level yet where they understand what they're seeing in front of them. Um, and that, that, so that's why you know, we love the education piece. Uh, and I have a personal passion for education and mentorship. But we don't make money there. Where we make money is on the realty side. We're real estate agents. Uh, so. When it comes to acquiring uh, a property, we make a uh, commission and we do this pretty well. Uh, I'm sure if you've ever worked with anybody else, trying to find a cash flowing asset in the city is very difficult. Um, layer on to that, if you wanna do any sort of more advanced strategies, you wanna do a laneway house, for example, you wanna have secondary suites, uh, like a basement suite. You know, I was chatting with uh, somebody today and they were asking me about basement suites. And I said, um, uh, we were talking about as of right. Um, and they had a misunderstanding, actually. They, they'd followed uh, us for a, for a little while, but they had a misunderstanding about what as of right meant. They thought that you have the right to build it, but it's you have the right to build it only if you meet all these conditions, then it's within your rights to build these, uh, you know, a legal basement suite. So you can't just go out there and buy any house and assume that it can be turned into a duplex or triplex. There's a lot of parameters, a lot of conditions that need to be met. Um, so this is, um, this is where we help you find those properties. 
and we're we get paid by commission we we don't charge extra for this fee we get you pay we earn money the same way that any other real estate agent would earn money but there's 45,000 real estate agents in the city we obviously have to be better than them and this is our advantage next thing is construction so let's say you buy this property and you want to do construction on it uh, because you want to turn it into a triplex or you want to build a laneway suite. We absolutely do this. This is a big part of our business. Uh, we have many active projects right now, everything from kitchens and bathrooms to, I mean, Ed's managing our project now, five units plus a laneway, multi-million dollar renovation budgets. Um, so yeah, we do big things. Um, last thing is management. So you need the place least uh, and manage, we, we handle that as well. Uh, we have strategic partners, which we work on for our leasing and property management. Next slide. This is the team. Um, I think this is everybody. Yes, this is a complete slide. <laughs> so good job. Um, we're, we're ever growing. Last year, we were really fortunate. Uh, we, we brought in three new people. Um, but yeah, anybody that uh, you deal with at Volition will be one of these uh, smiling faces at you. Next slide, please. One thing to, to note, everyone's an investor. <laughs> yeah. Everyone you work with on the Volition team is an investor as well. So that's an important uh, distinction between us and Joe Blow, Joe Schmo, real estate agent guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you talk about ARV, like everybody on the team knows what that means, right? Uh, there's no, uh, we're all investors. Uh, so yeah, that is, that is a very good call it, Matt. Oh, and, and, and sorry, uh, I think it was Schwata, Schweta. This is the slide. <laughs> this is the one I was talking about. <laughs> she was like, oh, I'm looking for someone to, to kind of like guide me through investing. And I was like, oh, we have a slide on that. Just wait, <laughs> this is it. So, this is you know, it's, we, we have a mission statement, but um, this is like really what we want to do because when we started real estate investing, when Matt and I and Sam, you know, many, 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 many years ago now, started our real estate investing journey, it was really complicated and it's very, really confusing. And even now, 20 years later for me, I'm still learning things. Like as I get deeper into development, as I get deeper into construction, there's still areas that I'm learning about. Um, but we try our best to be that eraser in your life, to blast through the complexity of real estate investing and, and act as a guide uh, to help you along the way. Um, this is just a reminder. I know we've had a bunch of new clients uh, join in the last uh, month or two. So my apologies if for whatever reason you've been missed on our mastermind chat group. This is a private group for our clients only. Uh, but if you've been missed, if we've missed you through the process, please reach out to Shelby. She'll make sure that you're added onto the chat group. Um, and it is a fantastic community of pretty crazy real estate investors. Uh, who talk about real estate and vent about bad policy and bad do all tenants. sorts of, yeah, <laughs> tenants. <laughs> like, it's a safe space uh, to, to talk about real estate, real estate investing. Um, and it is, a, you know, selfishly, this is the reason, one of the reasons that this meetup started is because Matt, myself, like we, we knew that we needed uh, a community to help solve our problems too. Um, we don't know, you know, the best test control company in the city. But thanks to the chat group, there's a lot of people who uh, unfortunately had experience with best control because uh, that's the city for you, right? Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful community. So next slide, please. Awesome, On to my market man. This is Matt's favorite part. This is where he's like super attentive because he loves to hear what's happening in the market. <laughs> so I'm gonna nod off now. <laughs> so unless you've been living on a rock, um, like, and the headlines have been everywhere. Sales volume is through the roof. And I think it, you know, I've probably talked about high sales volume before, but this graph, I mean, the 20, uh, 2021 bar uh, is that giant orange thing sticking out of February. Um, and you compare that to year over year 2020, and it's a considerable lift, 30, almost 40% uh, lift over previous years. And um, it is, you know, the headlines, I always tell, you know, one of my mantras is always read beyond the headlines. The headlines are very true this time. Um, sales volume is through the roof and, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that data being reflected now. Good next slide, Matt. 
What is a bit of an exaggeration, though, is the real resale home prices. So yes, absolutely, they are up and they are at records. But it's not like the sales volume that we're seeing. And you know, I think I can speak for for Ed. We we've been pretty active through January and February, and we were seeing just ridiculous things happening in the market. You know, 50 offers on a property, 30 offers on a property. Um, you know, bully offers that would happen in the morning and then two hours later, uh, 10 more bully offers coming in. Just insane uh, speed of the market. Um, what, uh, next slide, please. And so what I was gonna say is, um, but what you're seeing is not a huge, like there's a lift, but not a, a correlatingly massive lift in sales prices. And that's because if you look here at the new listings, we actually have better inventory, right? Um, it's not as difficult as it was through 2020 and 2019. We have a bunch of new listings. And if you go to the next uh, slide, what I think is very interesting is the sales to listing ratio. So this is literally the ratio of sales to listings. And the reason we care about this um, is because this helps us figure out like what's driving um, like what is driving the high sales, what's driving the, the sales prices. And when I see a high sales to listing ratio, even though we have lots of listings, that means there's tons of demand for that, those listings. It, those listings are being eaten up very quickly by high demand. Um, so a lot of people are saying, oh, is there a bubble? You know, is there real estate? Uh, is there gonna be a, a, a burst in, in, in the real estate market? And you know, my take on that is yes, the market is going to shift, but not without a reason, right? It's a cycle. So yeah, absolutely. Every, when you're at a high, at some point it'll come down. But what I have no idea about, and I don't think anybody can predict with any sort of accuracy is when that's gonna happen and how deep and long that will go into, right? Um, and that's gonna be the really hard thing because right now we're in a position where we have increased demand but we haven't had any increased immigration, right? The doors to Canada have been closed for a while. Um, but as soon as they open up, uh, you know, the government wants to, to have a good 450,000 people move in, uh, get into the country in 2021. That's an enormous number. And that's the catch up on the zero immigration we had basically in 2020. So that to me doesn't say decreased demand. Um, you know, as the economy starts to recover, it also doesn't signal to me decreased demand. So I don't see any big um, drivers to cause the market to correct. Now, something can be created, something could happen, the market can, could level off, but right now there's just no signals showing uh, you know, massive change in demand happening. Uh, next slide, please. Ooh, crazy echo. Next slide. So obviously, the the data is interesting at an aggregate level, but uh, you know if you've been following volition for a while, you know that what really matters is what's happening in, in, in a more granular level, because neighborhood by neighborhood can be quite different. We actually look at each of the individual municipalities and we track the data by municipality. So next slide, please, Matt. And this should be absolutely no surprise to you who've been following the market. Um, it's been trending up, trended up through 2020. And then right at the end there, you'll see through 2021, we've had a big spike uh, in single family detached. And if you've been working with me as an active client, you know that you know December was a little bit quiet. And then as soon as January hit, it just skyrocketed again. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And this is not average transactional price. This is uh, you know home price index. So this is tracking, um, you know, like for like properties. So a three bedroom detached home, for example, and it's tracking the value of those over time. So next slide, please. So um, we've been talking also about the condo market and there being have been a softening in the condo market. And I think last, um, last meetup a month ago, Ed and I were like, you know what? I, I think this is changing because uh, all of a sudden in February, things start to pick up on the condo side. And here's an article from, uh, from the Globe, you know, 
saying the same thing, you know, condos have started to turn uh, and they're starting to pick up again. So let's take a look at the data. Next slide. And this is what we're seeing. So if you look at uh, the tail end of this graph here, uh, condos did trend down through a lot of 2020. But in the last, I'd say, month or two, we've really started to see an uptake again in the condo market. Um, you know, it, it, people are seeing it as a buying opportunity. People are realizing that at some point, you know, COVID will end. They will need to go back to the office and they don't want to be uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they want to be still close uh, to the core. So in, in all areas, uh, we're seeing condos start to pick up again. Next slide. And if we look everywhere else, uh, next slide, so outside of uh, Toronto, kind of the north end of Toronto, um, same story, you know, uh, they're, they're recovering. Not at the it's not uh, at the same speed as you see Toronto uh, picking up in the detached, uh, but across the board, you are seeing uh, increases, especially at that tail end. You'll see it's, it's lifting there through uh, December, January, February. Next slide. Oh, that's it for me. Over to you, uh, Ed, to go through. Oh, actually, Matt, I think you're doing the leading on case study. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Ming. Uh, I stayed awake, so thank you for. Uh, <laughs> so fascinating. <laughs> thank you for being for being you. Okay, um, good stuff. So we we wanted to uh, change it up a little bit. We want to talk about a case study, and whereas normally a case study is about a property, a property we you know. Uh, you know, one of the great investment properties we, we helped our clients buy. Tonight's gonna to be a little bit different. We definitely have to talk about a property, of course, but we wanna focus on the investor and it'll be a hypothetical. We're not gonna talk about this specific investor and in, in their, their situation specifically, but I did wanna walk you through some of the thought processes uh, with regards to selling a property, which is funny because we, at Volition, we often, we all, almost always recommend holding a property, holding for the long term. We stress the importance of this. We delivered, we've delivered dozens of presentations to that effect, right? But really, selling a property is 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 a byproduct. It's a byproduct of understanding the bigger picture and understanding what you're trying to achieve. So, in this particular case, it happens to be a condo that that was purchased a number of years ago. And then this is now that now we, this investor just needs to start asking himself some questions um, around, hey, like, what am I trying to achieve? How does this property fit into my portfolio and into my real estate plan? Does it fit into my real estate plan? How do I even evaluate whether it makes sense or not? Um, so those are the types of questions you need to start asking yourself. So let me get, let me get a, a bit deeper into this. So this is, I'll sit on this slide because I don't have any other slides, but I'll talk about some of the considerations you might want to think about uh, when selling a, uh, selling a property. So, you know, at Volition, we don't talk about selling properties a lot because we want to help you build wealth. And one of the ma major ways you build wealth is buying a good location that has a strong economy and good GDP growth and job growth and population growth and all that good stuff rent, uh, low vacancy rates. And that's Toronto hits on all those accounts, right? That's why we, we invest in Toronto. But sometimes we need to figure out whether or not it makes sense to hold this. So let's, if we start asking some of these questions, it's like, okay, well, you know, depending on you, your situation, your lifestyle, what you're trying to achieve, um, cer sometimes certain properties, maybe they're just, maybe you, you can consider them just stepping stones. They're stepping stones to bigger and better assets. So you know, this time I bought a condo, maybe I bought a condo a number of years ago. Um, and now I'm trying to move on to bigger and better things. Uh, maybe those things are things like luxury triplex conversions, um, you know, big renos, uh, forced appreciation, things you can't necessarily do with a condo, right? A condo, you're pretty much at highest and best use already for that property. But is your capital at highest and best use? Now that's the question, right? Um, sometimes life situations happen. Sometimes maybe it's a health thing or maybe it's a family thing or you have kids now or whatever. You can't handle the stress of managing real estate anymore, both the asset management and the property management aspects. Uh, certainly, you know, you can always find 
you know, property management, uh, but you can't find asset management. That's you. There's no one that will replace, replace you in doing that. So there's still always an aspect of, of your involvement. And if you figured, okay, well, I don't want to waste my time on low, lower performing assets now. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's time to take a, look at, a closer look at your portfolio. So, you know, like I said, in a condo, um, it's already reached its, high, its fullest potential, its highest and best use. So you can put, maybe if, you, if I bought something else, maybe, maybe I, I can go further, right? Maybe you've grown in sophistication as an investor and these triplex conversions, which seemed super daunting, um, in the beginning, uh, maybe, maybe your level of sophistication as an investor has also grown, right? Um, and maybe that's not so scary anymore. Or maybe you've built up enough equity in this property that allows you to, to do one of those. If, sorry, what's my next point here? Maybe you've reached beliefs. Maybe you're at the, maybe you're actually at the divesting phase. This isn't, this again, this is not something a lot of people talk about, but imagine, okay, now I've grown my portfolio. I've held my portfolio for a number of years and now I'm at the divesting stage. Maybe I've, me, I've reached that magical point that I've talked about so many times where you've reached 50% LTV across your entire portfolio. And maybe that's good enough for you. And maybe you wanna sell off half, pay up the mortgages of the other half and live off the 10 or 20 or $30,000 of cash flow per month. Right? Maybe you're at that point. So selling is a necessity at that point, actually, to help, to help make that happen. It's really just trading uh, equity for cash flow. That's one way to think about it. Right? Um, maybe you have assets in different locations. Maybe you started as a small town investor um, and you know, now you, you see better prospects, for example, here in Toronto, and you want to you bring your portfolio back to Toronto. Uh, so selling those types of assets could make sense or, or from a headache factor, you just want to consolidate, you know, it's a really big pain in the butt to have, you know, properties over here and properties over here and properties over here. You can't leverage, you can't leverage your team. You can have different property managers everywhere. You got different real estate agents everywhere. It, it's hard to have focus. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to be laser focused on achieving your goal. If you're always chasing the shiny objects, right? Or maybe you've decided <clears throat> that you, you do want to grow your portfolio and you want to employ the volition multiplier effect, whereby you are able to double your portfolio in size every three years. But this might not be the asset to do it with, right? Maybe it played its role. It helped you get started in, in real estate investing. Uh, but this isn't the one I want to hang my hat on. This is not where I see helping me actually reach those goals. It was great. It, it served its purpose, um, but it's not going to help me get to where I want to go. Or maybe the market's changed and you're looking to reanalyze and reposition your portfolio. And maybe you just want to prune those poor performing assets. So here's a funny concept. Most people, we think of this in a different way at Volition. Most people are going to think, oh, if my asset has gone up, in, you know, $200,000 or $300,000. Oh, that's a great performing asset. I don't think of it that way. Neither does volition, right? No one, does, no one at volition does. And the reason is because great, absolutely. You've built $200,000 or $300,000 of equity. Fantastic. That does not mean this is a strong asset that I should keep in my portfolio on an ongoing basis. Where we saw this a lot was back in 2016, 17. We had a lot of Inv new investors to Volition. They were investors before that. They were buying single family bungalows in Willowdale. $1.5 million bungalow in Willowdale. And they were making about $3,000 in rent. I don't have to be a math whiz to figure out that does not work. So that's not a great asset. So Granted, you know, they might have bought that uh, and it might, might have gone up several hundred thousand dollars in a year. Great. That doesn't mean it was a good asset. It means they got lucky. It means that they were a speculator. A good asset is one that continues to cash flow on an ongoing basis. And look at this third point here. Here's the key. If I were to look at this property as if I was going to buy it today. 
Meaning that if I was going to refinance this asset to 80% loan to value, again, at today's valuation, would I still cash flow? This is part of the reason that the Volition's business model in downtown Toronto, which I'm sure all of you already know, you've, you've followed us for a while. This is why this is such a strong business model because this business model doesn't like this type of business model doesn't work if I bought a Willowdale bungalow, three thousand dollars in rent today. Next year, it's still three thousand dollars in rent. The asset value has gone up three hundred thousand dollars. Great, but if I refinance at eighty percent loan to value, I'll be cash flow negative. That's not a great position to be in either. You see where I'm going with this now? It's it's the whole concept of what I'm trying to communicate to you is looking at your portfolio in a different way, uh, seeing these properties for what they are, just an just a tool to, to help you get to where you want to go. It's a vehicle. And if it's not making sense for you anymore, then you really need to be ruthless in pruning the poor performing assets. And again, it's stupid to call a property that's gone up two or three or $400,000 as poor performing asset, but using the vernacular and the definitions we're using, if you were to refinance this at 80% loan to value, would it still cash flow? I now have a metric that I can measure this property against, right? So hopefully that hopefully that made sense. Uh, you know, hopefully I wasn't too long winded. Hopefully you were able to kind of follow. But again, this is just a preamble to this case study because I wanted to demonstrate to you that you know even though we have this rule or this these guidelines at Volition, we say okay, we'll hold for the long term. Yes, definitely. That's generally speaking, you want to hold for the long term. That's where the real wealth is built. However, there's an exception to every rule. And this is the exception to the rule, right? Does this portfolio, does this property still make sense in my portfolio as per my goals? And if the answer is it doesn't, then, or, it, or better yet, if you're having trouble figuring that out, that's where we as your real estate investment advisors at Volition, this is what we can help you out with during our advisory sessions. So in our advisory sessions, if you come in with a, you know, a snapshot of your, of you, of your portfolio, your financial um, circumstances, we can help you determine whether this makes sense or not, according to your goals. Okay, well, you know what, this, this asset you have, it's done really well for you. It's been great, but it doesn't fit in with the longer term plan that we think will help you reach your ultimate goal. And you, know, you might have some emotional attachment to it, that's part of the reason that we can come in and have an objective opinion of whether this asset actually makes sense or not. So we can help you, um, we can kind of coach and mentor you and advise you through that process. Okay, so um, on to the actual condo sale now, which I have no idea what this actually is. So this is where Ed comes in. <laughs> hey guys, uh, yeah, so this was basically, um exactly what Matt was talking about. Uh, you know, condos are great. Uh, they, they were great at building wealth, especially if you did buy a pre-con a few years ago. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of you have properties throughout Toronto and have been enticed by condos, especially when the pre-con prices were below resale values, um, say 10, 15 years ago. Um, obviously that's not the case anymore, but uh, for this client, uh, they did want to move on to some faster growing and better use of money assets. And uh, it, it's, it's like investing, right? Like you could leave your money, uh, it is, it's like stock investing or leaving your money in a bank account that has, say, a 1% interest rate versus putting it into an ETF where we're expecting roughly 10% returns a year. Which one would you rather do? you most people would rather put in the stock market with a 10 percent expected 10 percent return and not leave in a bank account or 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 some <clears throat> high interest savings account where uh their money grows at a very nominal rate right so this is the same thing with condos condos after a certain amount of years they start growing at a much slower rate than the newer assets or the newer condos in the market and eventually there's going to be a better use for that money because you are going to get to the extent of your refinance abilities. And also you're going to reach your extent of how much you're able to pull out of the condo while still being able to cash flow. 
in this case, this client bought it for 305,000 in 2007, or, and it was completed in 2010. They've been cash flowing ever since. They rented it up for 1850 initially, and uh, rents went up to as high as uh, I believe 2850 with parking and locker. So they were cash flow positive the whole time, which is fantastic. And Toronto, very low vacancy rates. It's uh, only two to three vac weeks of vacancy since 2010, which is, which is insane. That said, this condo, uh, th this owner of this condo decided that he's gonna want, he wants to get into some development opportunities uh, in some other cities where he's gonna be able to use what he sort of for this year, close to $750,000 towards, uh, and obviously with most of the, of the mortgage paid off, that's a significant chunk of cash to use towards another development opportunity where we are seeing much higher ROIs. Um, some of the ROIs that we're seeing on some of our own or my own developments are you know, 60, 70% a year or, or even higher, right? The returns are pretty nuts uh, if you know what you're doing. Um, even if you, uh, just for example, even if you were to buy it, say a townhouse in Willowdale, like uh, Matt, Matt said, and you were to redevelop it into a luxury home, um, say a 4,000 square foot luxury home, you're, uh, you're able to sell it for a pretty high premium. A 4,000 square foot luxury home might cost you around 1.3 million to develop. You might, you might be able to snatch up a bungalow in Willowdale for around 2 million. But uh, certain areas, you'll be able to sell it for four and a half to 5 million, no problem. There's, there's a significant markup uh, and that's a much better use of money than letting it sit in a condo and letting that condo appreciate at maybe 4%, 6% a year. The reason, and I think this goes for any investment, like whether real estate stocks or um, it's just finding the best use of your money. And uh, that's also what we're here to help you kind of figure out. It's, uh, but I think a bunch of us had properties and I think Matt has a bunch of properties in Edmonton that he's, he's like dying to get rid of because he wants to free up that equity towards other investments um, in better cities and faster growing cities such as Toronto. Um, as May mentioned, prices right now are sky high. I'm not sure if it's a proper time to invest, but they have been consistent go consistently going up for the past five to 10 years. It was a dip in 2017, but that those values went right back up. So really, it's it's uh, as much as we like to say to try to keep all the real estate you have. Uh, some some products such as condos, where they do start devaluing a little bit when condo fees rise, and they do start aging and getting a little bit dated. Those you may want to let go and move towards a better asset class, um, such as a multifamily home or a development opportunity. And uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's basically it for the case study. It's, uh, it's, it's just an outline that it's not always good to hold. Sometimes it's better to relocate. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess I should have asked, asked you to go on the next <laughs> slide. Sorry, uh, I, I think I went through this already. But yes, um, now to the main event. Uh, Dan, he's going to talk about insurance, what everyone loves. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just before we move over to to Dan, so so thanks thanks Ed. So yeah, I mean this basically I I gave a very broad preamble. Uh, I was like it could be you know investors should be thinking about this, they should be thinking about this. But in this specific instance, you can see this investor thought about this condo. It's very easy to have an emotional attachment with this, like. Oh my God, this thing made me so much money. I, I, it's been great. But this, this, this investor is a client of ours. He's a sophisticated investor. And he was able to still have an objective lens on this because he wants to move on to bigger meta things. He wasn't emotionally attached uh, to this asset. And so um, if you're having trouble figuring that out, does this make sense? Should I sell? Um, that's where we can step in. You know, reach out to to us, and I think um, Shelby, 
we'll, a bit later, we'll post um, some details on how to get a hold of us and, and how to go through our advisory intake process. But this is where we can add some tr tremendous value um, through our advisory and then all the way through end to end uh, being your investor focused realtors, helping sell this property, help and more importantly, helping you get into a, something bigger and better. Cool. So was there anything else you wanted to add, uh, team? Maybe? Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say like, you know, a lot of times people think advisory is like, well, what, what can I invest in? But advisory is really the bigger picture. It's understanding how to evaluate your portfolio properly. So that way you can make these kind of decisions. And we'll be, we'll be very frank with you, right? Um, sometimes it is selling. Sometimes we'll tell you, don't sell. Like I had a client uh, come to me last fall and they were looking to exit their condo. And I said, if you don't have to right now, don't. The market will recover. Um, just if you can wait it out uh, a couple of months, do that. And sure enough, the market is recovered or recovering now. Uh, and now's a much better time. Uh, to, to sell that condo than it was kind of in the, the late was that Was year. that instigated by fear or because they had something bigger and better or something else, some other reason? It, it was a little bit fear motivated because um, they, they had a tenant who was there for years. Uh, that tenant was moving out. Um, now they could drop their rents and get it re-rented um, or they were, were thinking about selling it. And I said, you know, quite honestly, it, it doesn't make sense for you guys to sell right now. Um, if you can hold on to it, uh, get another at least month to month tenant in there, uh, get into the spring, summer of this year. And at that point, exit it and you can move your money into something else. Um, but, you know, we'll be upfront, right? It's, it's not in our interest to try to just motivate a sale all the time. Uh, our best clients are repeat clients and we have to give good advice uh, to get repeat clients. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. Cool. Well, that was, uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, this was a little bit different than our normal, normal case study. A normal case study is putting up some pretty pictures up there and being like, Hey, look how much money I made. And, and Hey, like buy this now, or Hey, this is the before and after HGTV type. We wanted to give you a, di a different flavor for this case study. We wanted to focus on you as an investor rather than the property. This is why, like, I don't know if you've noticed this at any of our presentations, we're different than every other meetup and whatever uh, investor group out there. We don't start by talking about properties and talking about deals. The deal or the property is a byproduct. It's, it, it's what follows naturally after you have figured out the strategy and understood the fundamentals and all that other boring stuff that we, we talk about, right? But it's boring, but it's the most important stuff. So that's part of the reason that, you know, our masterclass was uh, on February 1st was like eight hours long. We didn't look at a certain single property until like hour number seven. Most people are probably checked out by that time, but there's a reason <laughs> for that, right? There's a method to our madness. We're very, very mad, but there's a method to our madness, right? So Anyway, um, all to say, uh, hopefully, hopefully this, uh, this case study landed for people in terms of, okay, it's not your typical case study. It doesn't just say, okay, buy this and you get this much of cash flow. It's not that type of case study. It was very much about looking and reevaluating uh, your portfolio through a, a sophisticated investor lens. Cool. All right, so now we can switch over to Dan. So I see Dan here now with his shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> I have to drop off. I'm sorry, guys, but uh, you'll have an amazing time with Dan. Dan is my my personal insurance agent, helps me with all all my properties as well, and has helped tons of our clients. But I'll I'll let uh, Matt do the real intro. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I'm always busting Dan's balls. Insurance is like is like it's as interesting as drywall, but uh, Dan's actually a pretty entertaining guy, so he he makes it interesting. Um, I'm going to so, try. I'm going to try. Guys. Um, Dan's, Dan's my insurance guy as well. Um, he has, uh, you know, he, he's done all of my properties. He's done a bunch of our clients. Um, he has seen us through some really crappy times when, you know, I know that there was a, you know, I currently have a flood in one of my properties and Dan's helping me. 
<laughs> right? Um, one of our one of our clients had a, a sewer sewage backup in one of his fourplexes, and it was a literally a shit show. <laughs> Good pun. Um, Good pun. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it was literally it was a shit show, and uh, Dan uh, stepped in and worked his magic, and the feedback uh, we got was he, our client was very happy to have Dan on his team. So, uh, so Dan is. Well, what do I have here? I haven't seen this slide before. Okay, so anyway, Dan's an insurance guy. Dan is, Dan is <laughs> Dan's in lots of insurance policies. He does, but he focuses on um, the commercial portfolio, if I'm not mistaken, right, at, uh, at Hub, which means he doesn't do your regular single family, sorry, your, reg your regular principal residence type of stuff. Um, he does the, the more interesting stuff. Um, this stuff is going to be cover your construction. It's going to cover your rental properties, you know, um, things like that. So, uh, you know, I've known Dan for a very long time. He's always led me. Um, he's never led me astray. He's always been, had my back. And uh, so anyway, without further ado, um, uh, I'll give you Dan Tetzlaff. So Dan, I'm going to give you, or can you, are you able to, uh, I don't know if I could take control, can I? Uh, let me make you a co-host and then... I will say to start, I'm reading the comments and flow. <laughs> Dad jokes are free here. Beautiful. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. So you're a co-host now, Dan. So if you click um, share, you should be able to share your own screen now. Oh, Shelby, do you have the presentation handy or no? I do. Would you prefer us to share it for you? Yeah, if you could. With this, I just moved and my new office isn't set up correctly and I'm on a computer that doesn't have it. Okay. Give me just a second. And I, I'll take a second to outline what I want to uh, educate everyone on. As Matt mentioned, this is not the most exciting um topic until you until you need it obviously most people if they have a claim they they want to feel confident that they have purchased um a policy that will respond for them and we find in the market the same way matt and sam and everybody uh on this call specializes we try and do the same and and we believe probably i mean i'm i'm pulling a random number here but i would suspect over 95% of insurance brokers aren't specializing in real estate which could leave you uh, exposed which obviously we want to help educate you so that you don't find yourself in a position um, where you're not covered essentially and then the second point i wanted to talk, um, touch on today is we're probably right now in the worst market for insurance in the history of the country, meaning um, it's extremely difficult to buy it, first of all. Uh, a lot of companies that provide realty insurance are exiting the marketplace because it's been so unprofitable for them. And with that, there's, there's quite a, a large supply versus demand issue in the marketplace, and it's driving premiums up significantly. And, and not everyone understands why per se. So I want to just touch on um, why, why is it like, why are my, so I'll get a call. Why does my insurance company not want me or why is my price going up so significantly? And, and I do want to touch on again that I'm a broker, so I don't work for an insurance company. I just work typically for my clients the same way uh, Matt would. And, and I guess our goal is always to get you the proper coverage or at least tailor it to you to, you know, balance costs with coverage. You don't necessarily um, have to buy something you don't want, but at least you should be aware, you know, what is available to you. Uh, and with that, I'll start. So this is what I would call sort of um, insurance 101 from doing anything over I guess, outside your principal residence, that would be a rental property, duplex, triplex, and so on. So I call it the pitfalls to look out for. And Shelby, if you could change the slide, unless I, can I do it, Shelby? No, I don't, I don't think so. so. Okay. <laughs> I'll just sit <laughs> that last at the end of each one. All right. So, so what I'm about to go over and, and I'll try and, you know, go through it without boring everyone to death are, 
what I, I find, or I guess in this case, the seven most important things that can be left off. And we were at a point maybe three or four years ago where, where a lot of these things were being picked up. But now that the insurance marketplace is so difficult again, I'm finding a lot of people sending me like, oh, what do you think of this quote that I've got from my current provider? Is it good? And I'm seeing a lot of limitations in them. So you have to be really careful right now while you're buying a policy. So, so the things to look out for are name perils versus broad form coverage, actual cash value versus replacement cost, uh, permission for vacancy, limited coverage during vacancy, vandalism, ensuring you have rental income, and the following three things that, that not are not always uh, provided to you in a quote, which are sewer backup, flood and earthquake. Next slide, please. So I wanna explain each one to you um, quickly. So, so when you go to shop for a policy, there's two forms of, of coverage that you can buy. So the starting point, you can either have name perils which is extremely limited. And I'm seeing more and more in the marketplace right now. And what it means is essentially the insurance company will list, you know, you have coverage for these six things and the six things they cover you for are super limited. So it's fire, lightning, uh, falling objects, vehicle impact, and two other coverages that are virtually useless. So mm -hmm. it's extremely limited in the fact that you really don't have any water coverage of any kind, which is very important for any rental property. I would say over 75% of claims are water related. Or you can buy, which is what you always want to buy if you have that opportunity, and it's called broad form coverage. And this means they cover you for everything unless they specifically write into the policy, we do not cover you for this. So if there's ever a gray area, for example, uh, back in, and we'll call it uh, like during the crisis in America where the World Trade Center was attacked, terrorism was not specifically excluded and therefore it was covered for the World Trade Center under their insurance policy. So broad form, great, name perils, try and avoid at all costs unless you are, are unable to get broad form. Next slide, please. Second point is uh, another thing you really want to look out for that, that I'm noticing some companies trying to slip in. There's two forms that they can settle your claim. So if they do, if you have a claim and you find out, okay, I had a fire, both policies, name perils and replacement costs cover fire, then they'd say, let's figure out how we're going to settle this claim. And there are two ways to do it, replacement cost or actual cash value. Replacement cost is what you always want to look for, which means if you have a fire, the insurance company will actually come rebuild your property for you and try and replicate the way that it was before versus there's this other form called actual cash value, which is extremely um, uh, it's up for negotiation as to how they would settle a claim, a claim, but what they do essentially is include depreciation into your claim. So you have a fire, they say, okay, it's going to cost $100,000 to repair, but your property's 70 years old. So we're going to depreciate your settlement by 70%. And instead of rebuilding for you or cutting you a check for $100,000, because it's depreciated by 70%, we're only gonna give you $30,000 to help you settle this claim, which on a large claim can be very impactful. So you really wanna try and avoid this, this basis of settlement. Next slide, please. Okay, vacancy allowance. I've been hammering this home for the last 10 years with any investor I can find because it's very mm -hmm. tricky. And it's very hard to find an extended vacancy period in any policy, but I want people to understand what it means. And it's essentially this. If you go out and you buy, for example, a, a rental property policy, you need to know how long you're allowed to have the property vacant for so that you can still have coverage afforded to you. So quick example, let's say Shelby goes out, she, she buys a rental property 
uh, she gets it tenanted and then six months in the tenant says, Shelby, I'm going off to, I don't know, he's going to, he's going to America and he's going to live in Florida. It's going to be really sunny and great for him. So now Shelby's property is sitting vacant in any typical policy. I'm going to say 98% of the ones sold in Canada, you have 30 days to fill the vacancy. And if you do not and have a claim after that, they will not cover you for anything. So if it does become vacant, you have to notify your insurance company. And many of the companies that sell these packages aren't necessarily very aware of this clause themselves until there's a claim where they don't do a very good job of indicating this to their clients when setting up the policy. So it's something that you have to be very careful about and always be in touch. And vacant means completely vacant. So if it's four units and two are occupied, you're fine. But if you have, for example, a single family property and the tenant moves out, you have an issue. And further to that, a lot of people like to create value in their rental properties. So they'll buy a single family, for example, they'll want to renovate it, uh, light cosmetic stuff, maybe new hardwood, painting, et cetera. And if, if they don't notify their insurer, they'll have 30 days to do it. And after that, there will be no coverage. Next slide, please. This is another coverage you wanna ask for. Also difficult to find in the market, but at least be aware that it, it's not covered on many policies. Essentially, um, it's possible and it's unlikely, but it, it does happen. And we've seen quite a few over the years in our, in our company, where if you have a dispute or an eviction process with a tenant is, is typically when you'll find this, um, you know, there, there's an opportunity on the way out if, if there's a, a dispute between you and, and your tenant to vandalize your property. And the majority of insurance policies in our, in our country will not cover vandalism by tenants. They will cover it by, for example, if you get vandalized by an outside party, but if it was the tenant living there that, again, we've seen an instance where somebody was evicted and the tenant decided to just put a bunch of socks in the bathtub, turn on the water and leave, not covered. Or for example, just, just general stuff like perhaps taking a bat, <laughs> a baseball bat to the property. Um, obviously it's not, not what you look for when you're screening your tenants originally, but over time things can change. Um, people can essentially be put in very difficult positions and, and act out against you. So if you can obtain this coverage, always nice to have. Next slide, please. Rental income is typically, um, it, it's offered, I'm gonna say in the majority of policies, if you make sure to tell correctly your insurance broker or agent um, that you are renting and that you provide them the correct limit. You just want to essentially make sure. So for example, if you have a claim, again, a fire, and now your tenant is unable to live in your property, you don't want to have to rely on the insurance company to repair your property very quickly uh, in order for you not to be essentially losing the rent you would have had each month because your mortgage will continue to charge you, obviously. And then secondarily, this form of coverage called lost rental income can be sold on what's called an actual loss sustained basis. And all this means is that if you increase your rent over time, they're not going to nickel and dime you at the limit you set up for. So for example, if it was $3,000 a month, but then two years later, it's now 3,500. If you have what's called actual loss sustained coverage, they will reimburse you for what you were being or what you were charging your tenants at the time of loss. And then finally, we just make a point that if you have a bigger property, uh, they usually also cap the time limit that they'll pay you for it. So for example, if you have an 18 unit building or a 10 unit building, you might want to look at extending the amount of time they'll reimburse you while the property is being repaired. So you can either buy 12, 18 or 24 months uh, and it's something to look at. But typically, if you're buying a larger building, I, I would be hopeful that the broker you're buying from is um, experienced enough to illustrate that for you. Next slide, please. 
And then the final three things, I have recently been through a sewer backup claim myself personally. Uh, these are these are tricky and and I'm going to say slippery things you need to look out for when buying a policy because I am noticing that they're either being capped or they're not being included at all and it can be a significant amount of money. I know in my case that I just had, uh, I'm going to say at my own brand new house I just bought that probably concluded about two months ago. I think the total bill to do the repairs was $38,000 for sewer backup. And you'll, you'll find a lot of the policies are trying to not include them or cap them at $25,000. So you need to be very careful with these three things. Earthquake, in my opinion, I mean, not, not as prevalent. I've never seen one personally in Ontario, but sewer backup and flood are, are you know, they, they can happen fairly easily. Um, in my instance, for example, it was it was a case of the pipe running from my house to the city hadn't been updated in 130 years. So the person who uh, rebuilt my house didn't change the pipe from the house going to the city. And there's really nothing I could have done to know to prevent that. Um, it's nothing I did wrong. It's just an aging infrastructure issue. Um, so it's something you definitely, I would have been pretty upset myself if I had to come up with the, uh, the $38,000 that that's something I want to use my insurance policy for next slide, please. And finally, so here, here's a good question that we get asked often, you know, why is it good to recommend to my tenant that they have their own insurance? And, the, and there's a few different reasons you want to do this, but any uh, well-maintained or run company that owns an apartment building or like a Matthew or somebody who has multiple rental properties will always look to do this. And, and there's a bunch of different reasons. So number one, for example, if your tenant per se has an issue, let's say they invite a friend over and they overserve them alcohol and the friend drives home and gets in a car accident and blames the tenant for overserving them alcohol. I know it sounds crazy, but this is the world we live in now. Uh, perhaps they injure themselves or they injure someone else. Well, if a lawsuit comes against your tenant and your tenant doesn't have insurance, and that person who drove home drunk was significantly injured, you will be next in line. So a judge will say, well, Jim, who no longer can walk because they got in a bad car accident, and now they're, they're impaired, needs to be taken care of and can't work anymore, at least for the next X amount of years. So your tenant, unfortunately, doesn't have $800,000 in cash kicking around. Now it's going to be you essentially um, defending yourself in a lawsuit against uh, the impaired driver for the next eight years, which is a massive headache. You'll have the coverage, but you're going to have to be involved in a claim. Two, let's say your tenant uh, who lives in your property burns your property down by smoking a cigarette. They, they have a cigarette, they drink too much, they fall asleep and they burn the house down. Well, your, your policy is gonna cover you regardless, but now this is a claim on your record. So when an insurance company, let's say you have five properties or 10 or whatever the number is, insurance costs are a very important thing to you. And if, if you have a loss ratio per se, so if you've spent you know, $20,000 in insurance premiums over a five-year period and they've paid out $500,000, you don't look like a very attractive client to the insurance company. So if your tenant had insurance, your company would have been able to recoup the money from your tenant's policy because clearly they're at fault as they are the one who burned down your property then it's not a claim on your record anymore. So for these two reasons, and then finally, like if you, if you let's say have a pipe burst in your rental property and now your tenant is basically has nowhere to go, if they have their own policy, they'll be put up in a hotel room and this is something you can't buy for them. So it's a good conversation. And I know in any um, recommended lease right now, it's typically a requirement that the tenants have their own insurance 
but it's really good like risk management and a good way to protect yourself to have that conversation with them up front to say, hey, if I ever had a claim, for example, a sewer backup and I ruin all of your belongings, when I mean I, I mean my rental property ruins all of your belongings and and now you have nowhere to live, I have no obligation as your landlord to put you up in a hotel or to repair your property. Essentially, you have to have your own insurance policy to do this. And if you have the conversation up front, it avoids a lot of back and forth or essentially an upset tenant that you could have uh, taken care of by just being proactive and telling them this. Next slide, please. I'm trying to sort of read the questions along. I don't know, if Shelby, if anyone wants to say, if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them uh, if we have time. Um, Shelby, you can, you can serve up the questions to Dan. Uh, I don't mind if, if, there, if there's anything important that somebody wants to ask, you can just stop me. I, I did see one, somebody just said, wow, great advice. But if there are any questions, if you want to <laughs> I like ask. how that's the one that you call out, Dan. Well, no, it's the only <laughs> one. The one that's like a <laughs> cut on the back. It's the only so one I saw. Do you um, wanna, do you, how about I, um, I'm almost through the presentation. And then before, I, if yeah. we have time that I explain why is like insurance going, you know, so why are the prices going so high or why are the companies non-renewing? Between that, I'll try and answer the questions. Okay. And I wanted to touch on this one because this also comes up to us all the time, uh, especially for, uh, again, if you're like a construction company, this is a lot easier for you to understand because it's your full-time business. But if you're, um, I would say, just an investor uh, learning through volition, you may not understand this. So I'll give an example of, uh, of a house that I lived in. Uh, Matthew and I sort of live in the same neighborhood and I, I had a semi-detached property in Leslieville. Okay, so let's say it was 1,400 square feet. It was fairly nice. But it was 1400 square feet. So if it burned to the ground, for example, uh, you might need $250 per square foot or maybe 300, give or take, you know, depending on the quality of the property, that, that would be the amount of money that you need to rebuild it. But I could have sold it in the market that was extremely, uh, like in our area, especially Leslieville, it went up so much. I probably could have sold it for, let's say, $1.3 to $1.4 million. So if I'm insuring it, my, my number that I would use to insure it would be $275 times $1,400. That's significantly less than, than what the market value is. So people often say, oh, I should, shouldn't I insure my property for what I paid for it or what the market value is? That really has no correlation to what you would insure, insure it for. And on the flip side, I would think of like six or seven years ago in Hamilton, people would be buying these like 3,500 square foot Victorian homes for $400,000. Don't hold me to that, but you get the picture. Like back then they were a lot more affordable. But if that 3,500 square foot Victorian home in Hamilton burned down, Again, that would be a lot, you would insure it a lot more for than what you actually paid for it. So people have a hard time separating market value versus rebuilding cost. Um, but you always are looking for rebuilding cost, which can fluctuate depending on some of the materials between now, I would say, between two to $300 a square foot. Next slide, please. Contents coverage is pretty straightforward. You just need to ensure when, you, when you're insuring your property, don't forget that you have maybe washer, dryer, fridge, stove, um, just some things that you would own um, that are gonna be left at the property or if you're furnishing it, for example, that you need to notify um, your broker, your agent that you need coverage for. Typically, they're gonna ask you this question when you're setting up a policy, but it's just good to remember. Next slide, please. And then this is a package that we sell for Volition members that will essentially pick up the majority of the coverages that I just went over. I'm not gonna dive into that very much tonight, um, but just if you're ever in a pinch where you think either, you know, I have no idea what I'm covered for, or 
or I know for sure my coverage is bad, but I didn't really know where to go. And I didn't know that Volition had this whole toolkit of, you know, whether it be lawyers or a long list of partners that they have that specialize in investment properties. I'm sure you can connect with Shelby or any one of the uh, Volition guys. We're not always out just to sell you something, but I'm always happy to at least just provide advice. And maybe you're with a good agent or broker already. And I would say, you know, everything looks great other than, you know, he forgot to, to suggest flood coverage and you could just go back to your current agent or broker and say, you know, can we add flood coverage for $50? So I'm just here to be an asset for the group or, or at least provide a second opinion if needed. And, and I'll see if I can answer some questions now. I don't really know how my timing is. I'll let Shelby moderate if she, if she can. Yeah, you got tons of time. We're, we're, okay. we're, going, we're going to till nine, so we're good. Okay, great. So Shelby, don't worry about the slides now. I'm going to go away from the, um, from the presentation now and try and answer a few questions. And secondarily, I'm just going to explain to people because the more and more, like the bigger you get per se, not as like the bigger you get, but it, so, so residential single family homes are the least impacted and then single family rental properties and sort of the bigger the property gets, the more it's being impacted by this improfitable insurance marketplace. And I'll touch on that in a minute, just to explain to some people are getting calls from their brokers. Like I can't get you a renewal or your renewal price is going up by 130% and people can't wrap their mind around why is this happening? Were there any questions Shelby that you picked out of the yeah, so we'll start with this one. Uh, can a landlord buy tenant insurance for their tenant? They cannot, unfortunately, because there is, um, for example, like one of the main principles of insurance is I cannot buy insurance for something that isn't mine. So an insurance company doesn't want you to be in a position. So for example, I know this is unlikely and this is sort of, this is a difficult one that, that some landlords do want to, sort of help their tenants with. But so for example, uh, they don't want me to be able to take out insurance on Shelby's house because then if I accidentally burn it down and I'm the beneficiary, it puts me in a position of extreme good fortune and I have no drawback really. So they don't want you to say, oh, you know, you could go steal all of your tenants belongings and just go claim it under, under their insurance policy. Um, the only thing you could do is, is work out perhaps uh, like a rebate or you could say, hey, if you carry your own insurance policy, I'll knock you know, your rent down by $20 a month. Uh, and then secondarily, just a, a tip to help sell it. If, for example, your tenant has an auto policy, which isn't always the case, depending on a rental, like in the city, not everyone has a car, but if they do, to add a tenant's package can be virtually nothing because they will get typically a multi-lines discount. So if they're paying, let's say $2,000 a year for their auto coverage, and then they add a tenant's package, which might cost like $300 a year, but they get 15% off their car, they're getting the tenant's package virtually for free. So that's a good um, sort of tip to try and help them purchase it. Great, thank you. No problem. A few questions about condos. Uh, what coverage is recommended for condo rental units? Definitely. So this is one where you're, you're definitely, you're way less exposed, for example. So the majority of all condo um, corporations buy their own insurance policies for the building, which covers the majority of everything in your condo unit, other than if you make like significant quality upgrades. So for example, if you had hardwood floors when you bought the unit as provided to you by the building, but then you've decided I want to put down gold flooring as a crazy example. Um, and that's going to cost like $10,000 a square foot versus the eight, $8 a square foot for your hardwood. If you had a claim, the condominium corporation will only put back what was originally there not the upgrades. So your own policy covers you for that which is highly recommended. Number two, by getting uh, like a rental condo policy, if there is a claim in the unit that makes it unlivable, 
you will then have lost rental income covered under that, under your own policy. The condo corpse policy will not cover you for that. And the most important, the reason I would never personally operate like or self-insure a condo unit is liability insurance. So again, if, if you have somebody say, I don't know, just your, your tenant has a friend over and they fall down the stairs because, and for some reason there was no handrail there, for example, and they sue, you would be named in that lawsuit as the unit owner and you would need defense and the condo corporation's policy will not defend you personally. And then typically for those, I recommend you add them to your own homeowner's policy if they will allow you to do so, just because it's so affordable to do it that way. And there isn't really um, much coverage exposure other than the liability and lost rent, which will be included in that um, personal home policy that you would be adding it to. Thank you. No uh, also related to condos, is sewer backup coverage applicable to condo units? It is, but it's very unlikely. Um, I know of claims that happened, for example, I can't remember, it was like six, seven years ago in Toronto. I was in a suit store on like the third floor of a condo, like a condo building and, and sewer backup was like shooting up through um, like a sink in the in this condo building that I was in on like the third floor. So is it, should you have it? You should, is it highly likely? It's not, this is when like, I, I remember Mississauga, like um, it flooded pretty bad. Like the golf clubs there I know were completely wiped out. I remember Weston is one um, that was also sort of wiped away. So I think in your own home, it, it's extremely likely to happen, meaning like for in, in insurance terms, that's like 3% or 2%. <laughs> but uh, in a condo building, I don't believe it's likely, but you, you definitely would want to have the coverage. And it would typically be included for you. Okay. This one might be a bit more lengthy. Can you describe the insurance requirements during the renovation or during construction? Yeah, so this is the one I would touch on anyway at, at the end, but it's good that it came up in a question. So you, so you need to essentially buy a completely different policy for the reasons I sort of outlined in the presentation. So if you go to buy, for example, a normal rental property policy, well, it's going to say you have 30 days to renovate. And if anything goes wrong after that, we're not going to cover you. So most renovations are gonna take a lot longer than that. And, and especially flips or other significant work like underpinning or additions are typically excluded or they will ask you when it's setting up if you're doing this. And if so, you need to buy what's called a builder's risk policy, which is essentially an insurance policy designed specifically for construction. And it's typically sold in three, six, nine or 12 months month blocks. So it is more expensive, but if you, for example, know uh, it's going to take me six months to renovate and then probably two months to get it on the market and sell it, you would want to buy a nine month builder's risk policy. And then again, it's designed specifically to ensure you correctly while you're renovating. And it does include some uh, small frills, for example, um, let's say you let's say Shelby's renovating and she's got $30,000 worth of product coming from Home Depot. So all the hardwood is in a truck. Well, the, well, the person who's transporting it, if it's your friend or maybe a company, it will not be insured unless it was like Home Depot delivering it. It will not be insured while it's in transit or at the project site unless you buy a construction policy. So it has little frills included in it to make sure you're you're properly covered. And again, if you want to be properly insured, you you have to buy one of these policies. Hey Dan, uh, tell everyone about what I, I, this wasn't one of your clients, or maybe or maybe it was, but he didn't buy this through something like that. That underpinning. That uh, I'm there. not going to say his name. Yeah, don't say the name, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th this was unfortunate. I'm not going to get into the details, but he here's a reason why you definitely want to make sure you buy um, from an experienced broker or agent that really understands what they're doing. 
uh, as far as construction. So, so this gentleman was doing a significant renovation in the High Park area on a four unit property. I can't remember the exact address, but I picture like an Indian Grove type, if you guys know the city well, like one of those um, sort of like really old, bigger houses that have been converted into fourplexes. So he approached me and said, let's set up the construction insurance. I said, absolutely. And then he said, I've got this quote from another company and it's significantly cheaper. Um, and I'm doing this massive underpaying project too. Like we're gonna significantly heighten the ceilings and, and reinforce the structure. And I said, okay, with me, it's gonna be you know fairly more expensive than that other company because I trust the company that we're going with who specializes in, in construction insurance, so on and so forth. And he said, yeah, but I have in writing from this other company and they understand I'm doing this fine. So begrudgingly, I said, hey, I, I would stick with the construction insurance company, but if the other company says you're going to be fine, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Sure enough, like a week into the project, the underpinning portion, the house collapsed, uh, total loss, nobody was injured, thankfully. But uh, when it came time for that company that was more of a homeowner's company, to pay the claim. They denied the claim, even though they put in writing that they knew he was underpinning. And he's still, I think, I don't know how many years it's been going on now. And perhaps some people on this um, watching may know the person I'm talking about, but he's still in litigation with the insurance company trying to essentially get them to pay his claim um, because he chose a, a company that, that really had no experience doing construction insurance in his case matt i don't really blame him because he got in writing from them but like it, it was such an unfortunate situation because if, if it seems too good to be true it was like the same price as his homeowner's policy but he was doing like a massive conversion on a fourplex where they were like digging and it was <laughs> fairly dangerous you got to put two and two together but some people will just again try and um, uh, complete construction on like a homeowner's policy for that. And, and my advice is you better off just not even having a policy if, if that's what you're going to do, because you're just, you're never going to get paid. Yeah. So, so the, key, the key is like, you want to be with a construction specialist or somebody who has some experience selling and understanding that, that insurance. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing. Basically some of the best learnings you get are for, for from tales in the, tren the trenches, right? Like everyone, everyone loves to share their, you know, their great stories, but you know, you learn, you learn a lot from other people's uh, pitfalls too. So definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, Shelby, are you going to keep reading? I see a, f a bunch more. I don't know if they're more, but I see one from, from somebody else. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so is it true if a reno is completed within 30 days, the tenant shares the contract would cover uh, the structure? Definitely not, if I'm understanding the question. Um, so basically, hold on. If the renovation was completed within 30 days, the tenant insurance and the contractor's insurance would cover the structure. So essentially, if you own a property and you're hiring a contractor um, and you have a tenant to like if they have their own insurance that still will not cover your your property so if let's say your contractor is renovating your property and they they are the ones who cause a significant loss due to their negligence the only way that your tenant's policy or the contractor's policy can be triggered is through a lawsuit and typically what happens is again if you have your own policy um, if your contractor burns your house down, your insurance company will come rebuild for you and then work with the contractor's company to get their money back without you really being involved. So it is not true, if I'm understanding the, uh, the question correctly, that ever in any scenario, your contractor or your tenant's policy will be able to cover you. It's only an opportunity for your insurance company to get their money back and then get the claim off your record. So, so never, ever, ever let somebody else buy insurance for, for you. That's a 
sometimes like a contractor will say, oh, you know, let me set it up for you. Like we'll help navigate you. I highly recommend against that. You always want to be the key decision maker and buying your own insurance. Um, it's, it's, it's in my opinion, the only way you should be ever buying insurance, not letting someone else provide the insurance company information on your behalf. What if the construction worker is, is hurt well on your site? Does the builder's risk cover that? So that's a fair question as well. So yes, so within that um, builder's risk policy, you'll also have liability insurance, which means if somebody sues you for anything, they will pick up the coverage. However, what people sort of, um, this is John's question, what people don't necessarily understand is, um, let's say, I think this is where a lot of people's minds go is if, if you have a construction worker, for example, um, a woodworker and he cuts his hand off, now is he, is he covered under your policy? Is he's not, he needs to have like his own workers comp insurance that would then reimburse her, re reimburse him or her for time that he cannot, he or she cannot work anymore. Um, the only way you would be covered is if the person who cut his hand off said, well, Dan was a tyrant. He made me work, you know, to, to meet a deadline like six days straight, 20 hours a day, I was too tired and I cut off my hand. Then if he sued me for being like a, I'll call myself a tyrant, <laughs> if he sued me for that reason, then my policy would respond and protect me. Uh, and what insurance would I recommend if a reno is cosmetic and completed within 30 days? Any typical rental property policy then. So for example, so this is the question, I'll read it. Um, what insurance would I recommend if, a, if you planned on doing a very light reno and then you were gonna tenant the property within 30 days? So for example, if I'm buying a new rental property and I know all I have to do is, is uh, paint it and then my tenant's gonna occupy the property in let's say 20 days, that's fine. So any normal policy will have that 30 day allowance built into it. But if you know for sure, again, that you're going to be going over that, you need to notify your agent or broker, and then they'll just charge you more for it. Or they'll say, we can't do it, one or the other. But if you don't notify them, that's where you can run into trouble if it goes over 30 days and if you have a claim. I think I'm good on questions. And uh, Shelby, I think we covered most of them. Agreed. I've got one more for okay. you. It was a direct message. Uh, if you have a three bedroom unit, does each tenant need their own insurance policy or is one enough for all of them? Yeah, each needs their own for the example of, um, let's say all of them are computer programmers and they have like $40,000 worth of uh, computer equipment. Uh, again, for example, you they can't insure other people's stuff you can't, you can only insure your own stuff. So if your property, for example, had a burst pipe, so they would say that's my fault as the landlord that the pipe burst and damaged all their belongings. Each one of them would need to have their own policy to protect them for their contents. And secondarily, if they needed to go to a hotel or again, in, in another instance, if one of them, I'll give an example of what happened to my friend for any hockey players out there. I think this is insane, but I'll give you the story. So essentially my friend who plays in like a men's league, a uh, hockey league in Toronto, um, he was just basically, there was like a, a guy on the other team who kept hitting him in the head with a hockey stick, like repeatedly. And my friend was saying like, Hey man, you know, I know the game's out of hand, but we're just here for fun. I have a job. I have to go to work. Stop. Maybe not so nicely, but something along those lines, the guy kept instigating, instigating, hitting him until my friend punched him in the nose Two months later, he got a lawsuit in the mail for like whatever, assault, injury, and so on. So that gets covered on his homeowner's policy. So again, would your tenants, all three of them need to have it? The more that you can encourage them to have it, the more defense you have in a lawsuit, the more better off they are is, is the best way I can answer. So yes, in like a in like a 200 unit apartment building, all those big companies that we we work for, they try and ensure that every single one of their tenants has tenants insurance. 
so that if that tenant starts a fire, for example, they can then go recoup the money off that person's insurance policy and keep their records clean. Does insurance cover electrical issues? So good question. It depends on what you mean by that. Like if it, if it breaks down by um, wear and tear or just aging, all policies exclude in them, in those broad form ones that cover everything unless they specifically exclude. They say, you know, we don't cover um, wear and tear essentially. So like if your roof gets old and you need a new one, they're not gonna come repair it for you. Same for the electrical. If the electrical has a fire and burns your house down, yeah, yes, there's coverage on most policies, I would say. I don't know if that, it's hard because we're not like interactive with everyone. I can't tell if I'm answering their questions properly, but I'm doing my best. You guys can unmute yourself and, and add on to the question if you need to. Yeah, if at any time I'm not answering a question correctly, please just, yeah, so unmute. Like Clubhouse is throwing out a bunch of questions. Is there, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? I get his, I get his question now more specifically. So clubhouse that, so basically in that scenario that you're asking for, it's like, okay, um, there are specific types of plumbing and electrical that the majority, if not all now to my uh, knowledge, insurance companies do not want. So for example, um, they are going to ask you during the application for insurance process, do you have knob and tube electrical? And if the answer is yes, to my knowledge, being pretty, pretty deep in this, in this area, you might be able to find one insurer at this point that I, I don't know which one anymore, but I, I think there is one. It's changed over the years. Do they cover the property if there's knob and tube electrical in it? I can say almost everyone will not. They will say, if you want to buy this property with knob and tube electrical in it, you need to replace it and get it removed within, you know, 90 days. They'll give you a time frame in which you need to remove it. Uh, and then it's okay. And some people say, well, there's hundreds of thousands of houses out there with knob and tube in them now. How did they get insurance? 15 years ago or 10 years ago or pick the date. I don't have the exact one insurance companies were okay with it but over time they noticed hey every time we have a fire it's related to knob and tube electrical so they started to outlaw it and what they do now is not all of them but most of them will grandfather it so they say we're not going to call up every homeowner and just take away their insurance as soon as they sell the property that will be the opportunity for the new owner to take it out and I think realtors like Matthew and, and all the bullish and people are going to know usually it's going to be a problem. And that's a negotiation that you can have with the buyer, seller, whoever it may be saying, Hey, you guys know, this is virtually uninsurable. So we're going to have to allocate, call it 35,000 to remove the knob and tube. So I think that probably better answers clubhouse's question. So it's very hard. And then even aluminum now clubhouse, which is another type of wiring used in the seventies, is, is very difficult to get insurance for a property on without an ESA certificate showing that it was installed correctly. What if you don't know? If you honestly, so for example, let's say you do an inspection and um, well, so they'll ask you directly, is there and there isn't. So if everything visible, and I have an example of, a, of an old RAIN member where this exact thing happened to him, he didn't know. So everything that was visible was copper. And then second to that, he actually got an electrician with a receipt in to do a report for him. And the house did burn down. This was my client, so total fire. And there was knob and tube behind the walls everywhere. The insurance company still paid the claim because they could see clearly he wasn't trying to mislead them. It's only if, for example, when they have like a million dollar payout, they start to dig a little bit more than they would on like a $20,000 payout. And if they find out you did a home inspection and all over the home inspection, the inspector said knob and tube must replace super dangerous. And you, you put on the application, there is none, then, then they would definitely try and not pay your claim as, as they can prove you deliberately lied to them to save money. Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't know, if you can easily prove it, they'll, they'll typically go good faith model and, and pay your claim regardless. And especially though they can, when they're, when they're investigating, if everything visible is um, copper and then there was some knob and tube behind a wall somewhere like they, they don't expect you to, you know, cut holes in your walls and look for everything. They're just trying to avoid um, where it's blatant and they can, they can avoid a claim. Cool. Thanks. Uh, if a home inspection, I, I'm fine with taking questions. If, if nobody else minds, I'm happy just to take questions. If a home inspection reveals possibility of asbestos in a property, I don't, there, okay, so asbestos is one that insurers don't ask about much. It surprises me. So the, the long and the, the quick answer is um, asbestos is excluded on virtually every insurance policy. If they knew you were buying a house, you know, with asbestos in it, they would still want to avoid providing you coverage, but they're less likely to ask about it because they specifically exclude it in their policies. So if somebody was to, let's say like your tenant was to die due to, I'm not an asbestos expert because I don't have to deal with it often. Um, but if somebody got sick because of asbestos and then they sued you, you, your policy would not cover that. So asbestos is, uh, Matthew might be able to, what, what do you advise your clients to Matthew? If you go to, you know, if I'm like Matthew, I want to buy this rental property, but we know there's asbestos everywhere in this, whatever, I don't know, everywhere, but there's enough to be worried about. What would you say? Not to put you on the spot. What do you say, Sam? Do you guys know? Like, I'm not, I'm not deep into asbestos. I don't come across it very often. What do you, what do you say, Sam? Well, I mean, it's really come down to uh, whether the deal is it's good or not, right? I mean, removing the asbestos, yeah, will cost maybe like, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars depending on how much you need to remove, right? But at the end of the day, if you get like fifty to hundred thousand dollars less than the market value, right? Then you know, we would uh, recommend a client, hey, um, uh, as soon as it closed, get the professional to remove the asbestos, right? But let the insurance company, like full disclosure in insurance company, something we're gonna remove. Uh, we'll get a get a confirmation from the professional saying that, you know, all the expected has been removed. That's and I would add, I would add to that, Sam, just if you typically like insurance companies don't care, typically, for the most part, if you're willing to correct something, like if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to buy a house, even though, you know, the roof is falling apart, they don't necessarily care if you're just going to go replace the roof. So it's good, I guess, yeah, a budget for it. Um, in most yep. cases. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Do insurance companies cover mold remediation? Mold and asbestos are excluded on virtually every policy because so they're what insurance companies love to avoid are things that um, form slowly over time. So they're all about covering what they would call sudden and accidental claims like a burst pipe or a fire, things that happen quickly, but what they don't like to cover. And here's like a good tip for every investor a lot of policies do not cover water leakage through a foundation crack because the insurance companies will say to you that crack formed maybe over 60 years. And then typically you could have noticed that there was some water spots coming, but you never you know, took the time to fix it until eventually the crack got so big that water started coming in. So anything that is sort of slow forming over time, like mold and asbestos, they, they typically won't remediate for you. They will only dictate to you. So they'll say, you know, maybe you have a claim and they notice there's a bunch of mold somewhere unrelated to that claim. You better get rid of that mold or we're going to cancel your policy. So, so mold remediation never covered. I mean, again, to my knowledge, unless there's some specialty policy out there that I'm not aware of, then, then that's very unlikely. So mold and asbestos, you better um, sort of allot or allocate money to remediate if you, in my opinion, want to do things the right way. Cool. Why don't we uh, use this opportunity to get you through the rest of your presentation and then we'll see where we land after that. I'll be quick about, I just want people quickly to understand, and I, I can do it in like a couple of minutes that they, they, why are insurance companies going insane? Why is my price 
why did it go up 80%? Like I get probably 10 calls a day from recommendations. Can you help me look at my policy? And it's basically long, long story short is there's probably depending on the size of real estate you're looking at to acquire as, as residential realty, I'll call it, this excludes commercial. So if you were to like own a mall, for example, which I don't think most people on this um, Zoom call are, are looking to invest in malls. I mean, if they could, great, but <laughs> you need typically quite a bit of money to do that. So why, why is residential realty so challenged? So let's say there's 12 insurers in the country that provide the bulk of residential realty insurance. There's one company that's been profitable in the last seven years and, and they're called affiliated and they essentially insure really large complex buildings and all their underwriters are engineers. So they've found a way to be profitable, but every other company to my knowledge that provides realty insurance has lost money for seven years consecutively. So even, you know, if you remember maybe three years ago, your policy went up by 10%, they still lost money, 10% again, still lost money to the point where a lot of companies, so I'll give you an example of one, I'm I actually a big supporter and I'm going to try and not use insurance company names here, but Intact will have like a board of directors meeting because they haven't, it's a large publicly traded company. And every year they've got to go back to their investors and say another 280 million down the tubes in residential realty. And it's gotten to the point where of those 12 companies, I would say five of them have completely pulled out of the market altogether. So they've said either we are going to close our company in Canada altogether, or we're going to stay in Canada, but we're not going to sell residential realty insurance. And every renewal that comes up, we're going to not renew it. So we're going to say thank you for your whatever 10 years of business. I know you, sir, never had a claim, but we're losing 280 million bucks a year in this space. So we're not going to do it anymore. And then there's seven companies left, but five of the seven remaining are saying, okay, well, we're not going to non-renew our clients, but we're not going to take on any more new ones. So then you've got two left that are saying, we can't take all the insurance for the rest of the country and these five other companies that are canceling everyone. So there's a huge supply versus demand issue. So, so that's sort of the basis for it. And then people say, well, why all of a sudden did they start losing so much money? And there's basically five reasons for it. So number one in the GTA, especially you've got a really aging infrastructure. So the reason for my sewer backup in my own house that happened two months ago was because the pipe from my house to the city, it was like 130 years old and nobody replaced it, leading to claims. Two, the majority of all residential properties outside of like your one to four units have plumbing that's never been replaced and could be about 100 years old. So they're starting to crack and burst often. Three, we have what we call uh, people, I'm not gonna use the incorrect term, but we, we have people that target lawsuits, meaning I have a claim on my desk right now in an apartment building where somebody didn't know they were on camera and walked into the main lobby, looked around and jumped and landed on their shoulder and then sued the building saying that the carpet in the lobby caused him to trip and fall because personal injury lawyers are advertising everywhere and are taking on clients free of charge. You know, essentially they take a basis of the settlement Insurance companies have to defend all of these lawsuits, whether they're frivolous or not. Uh, and that's be becoming a big problem in Canada. Um, they were typically insurance companies in the last seven years, we'll call it four years ago, they're always allowed to invest a certain amount of the premiums they collect. Apparently they're doing extremely poor with their investments. And then finally, if you look anywhere on the news, uh, whether it be California, you know, Louisiana, pick your state, even in Ontario, Canada, there's such weather fluctuations that are sure we had tornadoes and hurricanes before, but they're becoming more and more frequent, we believe due to, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but due to climate change and all insurance companies in Canada have to buy reinsurance. So the same company that sells reinsurance in California to the guys who, you know, for all those wildfires, your company, your domestic insurer is buying reinsurance through them as well. And those prices are going through the roof. So it, it's, it's a really bad time for the insurance business. So 
I just wanted to get your members to sort of, and if you haven't experienced it, cause you only have, let's say, and not only anything is great to have, but if you have like a duplex and the price has stayed fit fairly stable, you know, good for you. But if, if you're on the other end and you, you've got an aplex and the price went up 80%, you know, that's a pretty detailed reason as to why it's happening. And will it level out? It will. Like once one company turns a profit, they'll start undercutting each other again and, and the cycle continues. But that that's the reason that this is happening. And that would be my presentation on insurance. Cool. Well, that's super, <laughs> super interesting. Um, so I know John's been a, a big advocate all along. <laughs> he's, he's been... Uh, John, John's pumping my tires. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I've always shied away from insurance. I never, the terminology, and uh, but you've, you've simplified it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm trying my best. And, and like I said, you guys have so much to worry about, as Matthew knows, being investors. You just, if you have the right, like I can tell you personally, I, my, my tax knowledge is very weak. But the, the people I use and perhaps Matthew uses, probably the same guy might be, is super knowledgeable. And I don't really take the time to learn as much as maybe I should because I just really trust the person that I have. So I, I'm here again as a resource to try and help people where they need. And if you're ever confused or unsure about something, I'm, I'm easy to track down. Look at this. Ling Chung said, very informative session. One of the best recent <laughs> guest sessions. If I get life. even like second best at, no, sorry, ninth best out of 10 for insurance, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> no, that's, uh, no, this is good stuff. Um, if, it, if it's okay, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, ask Dan some pointed questions. So uh, uh, I, I'm only asking these questions because I know Dan can handle it. So um, I feel confident if it has anything to do with insurance, but if you're still <laughs> asking me other stuff, I'm not so confident. Go on. So one of the questions we sometimes get, you know, in Toronto, we can buy legal triplexes or non-legal yeah. triplexes. So Dan, if I'm a if I'm an investor and I am I worried about you know this thing's not zoned properly, should I be worried? You should not, you should not, you should always check if you're not, let's say, if you don't have your insurance with, let's say me or, or somebody, it, it's a good question to ask, but here's the, here's the answer that basically nobody, it's, it's a topic insurance companies don't want to focus on and, and we're fine with it because it's going in the favor of our clients. So uh, I think I asked you, Matthew, one time, I, I don't know if, if I'm, if I'm right, but let's say 90% of the, of the rental properties in Toronto are non-conforming. Is that more or less? What do you think? 95? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. I think you told me it was like really high that aren't legal. Yeah. So I think the insurance companies know this and they deliberately do not ask the question during their application process. And they can't deny a claim if it's not specifically excluded anywhere in that broad form policy saying, you know, if you have a non-legal or non-conforming triplex, we won't cover you. What I do recommend just as a calm, like just using common sense, it's like, there's so many reasons you can be non-conforming. And I don't even, I'm not sure this is correct, but I, I feel like somebody once told me, you know, they had a triplex in the city that for some reason, I forget which city had to have, three parking spots for it to be conforming. I don't know if that's typical or not, but what I do recall is I said, yeah, who cares? Like your insurance company doesn't care about that. That makes it no more or less dangerous. If for example, you plan on putting 15 students in a basement apartment with like, you know, only a window to escape from if there was a fire, well then that's being, you know, non-logical and you, you should watch out for that. But as long as there's no safety concerns, then no insurers seem to care at this point. And, and because again, it doesn't make it really any more or less safe. If you just focus to the common sense, things like have working smoking detectors and, you know, try and provide your tenants with the fire extinguishers and anything logical, then it's not an issue, but that question gets asked a lot. It's a fair question. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I'm going to point out some, some 
some specifics there. So the key component there is broad form coverage. So covered unless specifically excluded. And as Dan was saying, it's not specifically excluded. As long as you're any answering- Any policy I've ever heard of. So again, you got to check with the person you buy your insurance from, but I'm pretty confident. I've never heard of a claim being denied in my career through me or somebody else for being non-conforming. Yeah. And so as long as you're an answering truthfully on the intake application form, um, you know, are there four units? Yeah, there are four units. Are there three units? Yeah, there are three units. They don't ask anything more than that. I filled out Dan's <laughs> hub insurance form. It's a big pain in the ass. Uh, but I, I pulled that thing out so many times and it doesn't ask that it, it asks how many units are there. Right. So I know of, let's say all the companies in Canada, you know, call them like specialty companies of all of them. There's one that asked that question and they focus on student property. And I guess for some reason that they, they really find knowing that answer, if it's conforming, they have better, I guess, claims history. Um, but that's one out of, of, of many. So it, it's, it's more than likely you'll never be asked that question for the foreseeable future. So this is important too, because, you know, from the liability perspective, a lot of, you know, sometimes we get the question, Oh, what if, what if, what if, what if something happens? And as Dan pointed out, it's really about fire safety. It's really about, you know, so with Volition, we'll walk you through these properties. We'll point out things like, we'll be like, Hey, Oh, that basement bedroom didn't have, a window like that's going to be a problem for um, fire fire code and fire safety. Uh, oh, you know we're not we're, we don't have a good fire separation between units. Like that's going to be an issue. Like those are the types of things you know looking at things from an investor eye. And this is where we can add some a little bit of value. I'll plug ourselves a little bit, but this is where we can add some tremendous value in a walkthrough because we have the eyes for these types of things and and and, and so we can mitigate that risk on the fire safety side. And as Dan has mentioned on the insurance side, you can be confident that it'll be covered on the liability side. If some, you know, something yeah. happens. Yeah. So cool. Thanks. Uh, next question I was going to ask you, um, tenant insurance. I think someone else asked, um, how much, where do you normally get it from? Do we get it through you or not? Yeah, I tried to touch on it a, a bit during the presentation, but also trying to keep everyone's attention. So again, it, it's a great tool. The bigger you get, you're probably going to have a claim at some point. So the more your tenants have insurance, the more you can essentially deflect the claims back onto their policies, where you always want to start with every one of your tenants. Is if they have a car, automatically, you're going to add it to your auto policy. So you would say, hey, Mr. Tenant, I noticed you have a car. If you call that company and you add it, so if you say, I'd like to add a tenant's package to you know, couple it with my auto policy, they're going to give you a multi-lines discount, which if it's, again, I would say your average price for it is like three to $350. If they're getting you know 15% off their car insurance, it's virtually free. So so that's where you always want to start. And then second from there, there are, a, and you don't want to get it from me. Uh, we do offer it, but our price point, I'm just being honest, is not the best for our insurer. They're more specialty. They really take the time to understand your property. And for this, for like a tenant's package, it's best purchased through an online forum. So I believe there's a company called um, Zipsure and there's a bunch of others online that you could send your tenants to. And it's so affordable and they can buy it. And like Matthew mm -hmm. said, the forms that they're going to ask you to fill out or your tenants, they'll, they'll be like, you know, six questions and it'll be $220 pay online and you'll have your insurance. So it's all about ease of doing business for your tenants. I believe like they, they find it as a, a pain in the butt just to buy it. And they think it's going to be expensive, but if you can encourage them, it's it's a good idea. And and I think in okay. every lease, it's it's mandated. Go ahead. Sorry. Is there a question? No, someone just forgot to mute. Yeah, someone just forgot to mute themselves. Um, so actually, uh, you raised the point before. You've mentioned it a couple of times. But uh, Dan, so, you know, I can go out and find something from TD or wherever and uh, 
you know, it's coming in at a lower, lower price point, but hey, can you help me kind of decipher and compare and contrast these two policies? One, one that you're showing me and the one that TD is giving me? Yeah, so to, this is a bit of a self plug, but it's just the honest truth. So for us, um, we're still gonna be cheaper so that we have this package for Volition members that package will still be cheaper than I'm gonna say eight out of 10 inferior policies. It won't always be the rock bottom price. If you buy a really inferior package, eventually it catches up to us. But the reason we, we are able to offer sort of a very broad package at a lower price is we really only get our clients from these groups working with professionals like yourselves. And then, then there are some other groups as well that, that we work with where people are very invested in doing this. It's not like I bought a student property because my kid went to school and I didn't really know what I was doing and I just had it for three years and then sold it. So we've proven through our education and through the education of all our clients and the groups that we're associated with We've been able to keep the claims down for the insurance company and not to a price where it's like they're getting rich in our little, I'll call it our pool of money. Typically the insurance company makes like 8%. I think that's fair. And, um, and then our package, we typically we don't typically we, we've built it so that it's the best package coverage wise in Canada. Cause we never want one of the associations or groups we work with like you to say, Hey, Dan, I recommended you one of my clients, they had a claim and it wasn't covered. And if only I had to send them to TD, they would have had coverage. To my knowledge, if it's not covered on the package that is approved for your group, you cannot get like the, the type of peril, I'll call it anywhere else. So basically, we want to protect anyone who refers us business to know that if it's not covered with us, they couldn't have gone anywhere else and gotten the coverage. Yeah. Simple sure, word here, I guess, but <laughs> it's yeah, where, where this, I mean, where this started was, um, so Dan and I met through Rain over a decade ago, right? And uh, this, you know, Rain yeah. had, Rain had, you know, whatever, 3000 members or something like that. And there was a, there was buying power there. And so Dan and hub uh, developed a package that was specific to rain and, and groups like this. And now Dan has extended those types of that type of coverage, extra coverages, um, as well as preferred rates to volition and volition clients. So that's, that's kind of the history with it. So I've been with it for over a decade now yeah. and uh, I've been using, using this coverage uh, because it is sort of like a, a rock star type of insurance package. I can't believe I said rock star and insurance bad, in, the same, bad. in the same sentence, but, uh, um, but anyway, uh, all to say, you know, Dan's been also good. Like I, I brought stuff to Dan before or probably earlier on where I was like, Hey, you know, I got, I can get, I got quoted at some, somewhere else. Can, can you, can you tell me what the differences are? And Dan like sat down and he showed me, okay, this is policy A, this is policy B. Here are the differences. It, you know, it's the same price. It's a bit cheaper whatever, but at least at that point I could make an educated decision. And then that's the point, right? I can, I can specifically know that I decided to go without certain, certain things or because I, I, I wanted a cheaper price point. Ultimately I didn't. Uh, risk aversion and risk mitigation is, is, is in my DNA. Uh, but anyway, ju just so you know, Dan is, is great as a resource for that. And I don't think uh, he, he's op opposed to uh, analyzing other people's, other people's quotes. Happy to direct someone to another company. If there's an advantage there, it's all about, again, what, what's best for, for, for the client. It's funny, man, just quick story. 10 seconds, there's an old Rain member who's very insurance adverse. Like he doesn't like insurance. He only carries it to satisfy his lender. In the last year, he's bought three cars. I'm going to say over 150,000 each. No insurance on any of them other than liability. I'm like, that is crazy to me. Like you got a brand new Porsche. And if you get hit, you know, if you hit it, it's done. And he's like, no, I'm good. I got the cash. <laughs> but he's done well in real estate investing. So I guess, you know, something to shoot for. Yeah. Um, here, I got something else for you. And you may not do this anymore, but I'm going to ask. 
Um, I had a, I had this conversation with you a few years ago where I was like, hey, kind of broad strokes, can you give me sort of a, a formula or an algorithm to try to figure out what ge generally speaking something might cost me? And you were like, okay, this many square feet above grade, this many square feet below grade. Using I've, got, I've got the answer now. And I'll tell you what I do. So I can't answer it now, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a note. So um, there's a company. So if you are any type of um, like, let's say you're going to build a hundred condo units or 500 houses, or you're a custom builder or whatever it may be, there's a, there's a consulting company called Altus and they're a client of hub and they are like the biggest cost consultant in the world to my knowledge. And what they do is they, they basically work with all these companies. And at the end of each construction project, they take the numbers in, they put it into like a, I'm going to call it a database. And they've, they've created a report now that they release annually. That'll tell you in Toronto, in this neighborhood, if you're with wood or if you're with brick, this is what it costs on average for everyone who built last year. And I'll send you the report. Okay, cool. Actually, so I can't really. So right now, just with no information, I would tell you it's gone up like construction costs. I think most people would probably know whether it be materials, labor, et cetera, in Toronto have gone up fairly significantly. I'd say like the average now is 250 bucks a square foot. Um, but I have this report that I'm going to send to Shelby. And if she wants to um, distribute it to people by it, by all means. Okay, cool. Actually, that wasn't my question. But thank you. Oh, thank, I'm thank so sorry. That. I misunderstood. But, the, but the, the, the question, so taking that a step further, the question was, how can I calculate kind of back of the envelope uh, what my premium might uh, look like? And then, okay. so I think you and I had this conversation. I think it was because I didn't I still want to stop bothering you or, or, or maybe have something. Yeah, like I that, understand. Where People. it was like, okay, this many square feet above grade, this many square feet below grade. Um, how, many, how many tenants, how, uh, how, like rental income coverage, and then some sort of multiplier effect per hundred thousand dollars of coverage or something like that gets me to basically plus or minus what my policy premium monthly or annually would be. You got it. You know what? In, in, the, in the current market, it's so crazy. I can't even can't do, do it anymore. anymore. Yeah. Meaning we, we got to just, if people are really serious about buying a property, uh, yeah, we just got to, we got to help them through the process at this okay. point because the pricing is so like if, if one company says no, the next company could be 200% higher. So it, yeah, it's, right. um, it, so this it's is something that we, you, you gave me a formula like this and years now, ago. And then I guess I have to, we have to scrap it in today's. We got to scrap it for now and just keep asking us to get you <laughs> a rough estimates because there's too many factors right now. <laughs> so the last thing I have here, um, one question is mine and one question is from a guy from earlier. I'm not sure he, that he posted it, but um, Hub's intake process is super, super painful. And what uh, we've, we've talked about this, what are we doing to try to make this less painful with all the back and forth and all the questions and everything else? Yeah. How do we do this in a, in a better, more streamlined way? I would say this, not trying to defend myself and I'm not like offended in any way, but I would say our, our intake process is probably a lot less arduous than most currently. However, the, the best way to ever to help with this is if you are buying a rental property, you're going to, you're going to get sent an application for insurance, it's probably going to take you 10 to 15 minutes to fill it out if you know the information fairly well. If you do not, the best is to fill out as much as you can and then provide us with the home inspection for us to pull the information from and not share with the insurance company. Third, if you're not getting a home inspection, it, it, it's just, we would have to work through it together. Unfortunately, I know it's not paperwork is not your best friend and not many people's, including myself for an insurance company to say, you know, I'm going to back this thing for $800,000 and, and they want you to fill out a form that might take 10, 15 minutes. It's just something that you have to unfortunately um, go through and we're trying to, to get around it, but the more information we can provide typically helps get a better price point. So Enough, right? uh, it's probably probably not the answer you want to hear, but it's just I gotta be honest. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. No, that's good. Um, someone earlier, I think his name was Michael. I don't know if he's still here, but I'm going to ask a question on his behalf because I don't know if he's still here. Um, he's saying he's a private mortgage lender. So he lends private money, probably second mortgages or something like that. Yeah. And he's saying the person that he's lending to can't get insurance because where he's borrowing the funds is a private mortgage. Yeah. Private correct. mortgage lender. I've yeah. never heard of the bore, like the lender having an effect on the insurance policy. Have you? Yeah. So that that's typical for your not. So that's like a personal lines policy. So they basically, um, if you're working with a non specialty broker or agent, the, or they're going to connect you with a non specialty insurer that essentially has a bunch of parameters, not really understanding anything about what you're doing. So for example, not only will they not like, I'm going to call it a private lender because they'll think you're high risk. They think you're going to a private lender because you don't have enough money to, to get exact, right? Like they think that you can't go to Scotia because you're, you're so high risk that you've got to go to a private mortgage or even for example, any type of lender like that and many insurance companies, as soon as you hit a third mortgage, doesn't matter like what the, the amounts. So if I have three mortgages all for 20 grand each, they would say you're uninsurable because you're too risky versus a guy who has 5% down on a $3 million house. They just don't take the time to really understand your business. So that gentleman who's running into those problems the people who are like, so he's loaning money to a guy, that guy goes to buy insurance and he's running into challenges because he's probably just calling like his personal home and auto provider who, who it's not, it's again, you can't specialize in everything. I'm not saying like they're not intelligent. It's just, it's their insurance company. It just doesn't really target this and they don't care to learn to understand it. So that, that that's definitely a, a factor for sure for some. I mean, I've never run into it, but I, it's also because I, yeah, because you work with that and we know like, <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we have clients with a lot of mortgages, I'll say for a bunch of different reasons, uh, whether they be a B or C lenders, doesn't really matter as long as there's a logical explanation for it, other than I'm so leveraged that I might go bankrupt and I keep boring, then, then, uh, it shouldn't be an issue. Cool. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, is that it? Any other questions? Nah, we're good. Dan, that was awesome. And uh, Flo thinks that uh, you should have done a, a mic drop. <laughs> I thank everyone for at least having me on. I try and do my best to just simplify. But like I said, I understand it's not the most exciting topic. So Matthew knows, Shelby knows, I believe, and Sam or anyone, anyone on the team how to connect someone with me. And I'll always try and walk somebody through the process, especially if there are insurance specific questions that they're not comfortable asking in front of the group. I'm, I'm easily accessible. Awesome. Sounds good. So, uh, well, I'm giving a round of applause to, to Dan. I don't know if anyone else is, but uh, thanks, buddy. Same here. <laughs> thanks guys for having me again thank you, thank you. Awesome. awesome thanks dan all right so la last lastly now what sign up for advisory so as i mentioned we've alluded to advisory uh many times throughout uh, this presentation advisory really is our secret sauce it's where we can help you uh we can help accelerate you towards your goals um, and help you in the context of real estate. So sign up. Are we, what are we, what are we doing, Shelby? Are you going to send the link in the chat? It's in there. Yeah. It's in there. Okay. So uh, is it a Google form? I can't see. It is a Google form. Okay, yeah. So, if you fill out the Google form. <laughs> cool. So we have a, a, a slightly modified intake process right now. We're trying this out to try to streamline things because we're getting inundated with requests. Um, fill out, click on this link. It's a Google form. Um, fill out the Google form upon, after which we will send you a link that you can book a time uh, using Calendly with one of our real estate investment advisors. Right? Correct. Awesome. Thanks, Shelby. Um, next, next month's uh, meetup. 
Oh, we already have it scheduled? Damn, we're good. What it, okay, what's it about? Construction. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. So we, we touched upon construction uh, at our February 1st mastermind, uh, sorry, masterclass. Um, we walked through a street smart tour in, um, for February's monthly meetup. We walked through two properties. Um, one was just being finished converting to a, a triplex and one is just starting a fiveplex conversion plus laneway. Um, next month is going to be a, a we're going to walk you through the construction process for a multifamily conversion. So uh, I guess on HGTV, oh, that's those two guys. They look, they look the same. So I'm assuming they're brothers. <laughs> I'm assuming that, the, that those guys are the property brothers. And uh, yeah, it's nothing like that. Uh, I know, I know one of these guys, they're just actors. <laughs> they know nothing. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. Is that the last slide we got? Okay, masterclass. And then we're gonna go really deep in our 201. Flo's, I'm just waiting for Flo to kick my ass for announcing this. Uh, we don't have plans for this. We don't have all the specifics around this. All we know is that we wanna do one. We wanna do a masterclass 201. It's gonna be a follow-on from our 101. And this is when we're gonna go really deep into legal legal luxury conversions and laneway housing. So I think you know we're gonna give I think in our next month's meetup, we're going to give an overview of the process, but this or just a high level uh, perspective of what's involved, but this is where we're going to go deep into like the financials, the, the, the timelines, um, all the steps necessary. This is going to be a, a, a very, a much deeper dive uh, into it. And hopefully you should walk out knowing what the process is and, and, and understanding the business model and, and being ready to start doing one on your own. And who can do it? We think you can do it. So uh, Shelby, what do we got? We got I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna quickly launch a poll if you can take just a quick second to answer. There's just two questions for your feedback. We'd really appreciate it. How much value did this meetup provide on a scale of <laughs> one to five? Oh shoot, I'm the organizer. I can't I can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would skew the results, huh? <laughs> A little bit. No, um, yeah, I mean, unmute yourself, turn on your video. It'll take a few minutes just to kind of uh all unwind and recap, and you can tell us how valuable or unvaluable this was the session was. Did you guys have any questions about the case study that we were chatting about before? or the process to think about how to reanalyze and reposition your portfolio. Quiet bunch. Well, right now it's just me and John and Shelby hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, who do else, who else we got here? Who's brave enough to- Yes, everyone. I guess everyone's working on a poll, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it's that hard to, to, to click. <laughs> um, and as an addendum to this is if, if, that, if your answer is, is not a five, then tell us what we need to do to be a five. Tell us if we are off the mark, tell us uh, you know, suggestions for future meetups, suggestions for future speakers, different topics. Hey, I want more Tales from the Trenches. Hey, I want more renovation. I want more construction. I want laneway housing. If it's not, if you're not telling us we're a five, then tell us why we're not a five. And then let us give you a, let us have a chance to deliver a five. Yeah. Any more, was there any more uh, comments? What's Dan's contact information? So Rachel, um, you can reach out to, to Shelby at uh, info at volitionprop.com and uh, Shelby can connect you. Make sure you tell them that you're from Volition. Uh, that's how you're gonna get access to these packages and these preferred rates. They're not accessible to just your, your average person. 
Oh, look, sharing poll results. We got, we got, we have three fours. Okay, so I'm expecting those three people to tell us what, uh, what we can do better. <laughs> and look, look how many people are, are ready to invest. Woo! All right, sounds good. Well, is there anything else? I'll stick around for another five or 10 minutes just to like chat and, and uh, answer questions if, uh, if you're so inclined. Thank you, everyone. Otherwise, you can sign off. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. No one. All right, looks like I can uh, I can leave early tonight.